authorities have looked for clues in a new Canaan Park, New York State, and Connecticut's capital city. The FBI is once again focusing their search here on the secluded woods of Waveney Park. The evidence police would discover inside Jennifer's home. What was in those trash bags thrown out in Hartford? Who was with Fotis that night? People say the spouse did it. Mm -hmm. I know, but you know, I know what I've done and I know what I haven't done. So I, I, I have to stand and fight and uh, hope that the tooth is going to come out. Okay. Hello and welcome. This is going to be part two of my videos on the Jennifer Dulos case. I did do part one last week. I did record all of that video on the same day. The issue with it was the sun. Uh, the sun just kept creeping closer and closer and by the end of the video the camera wouldn't even really focus on my face because it thought it was so dark in the room but really it was just so bright in particular places. So I'm recording part two now obviously on a different day so I'm sorry that video was so short but here we are. <laughs> If you haven't watched part one, I do recommend you watching part one because I do go over uh, Jennifer Dulos' family, her background, and her relationship with her uh, estranged husband, Fotis, and I cover her initial disappearance. So like I said, I do recommend watching that. I will link part one in the description of this video, but uh, regardless, let's jump into the the rest of it. I do want to talk a bit about Michelle Triconis first. I did say in the last video that I would talk about her more. Well, here we are, we're talking about her more. Michelle Triconis, as I stated before, was Fotis's girlfriend. Jennifer found out about Fotis's affair with Michelle, and specifically it appears she found out about the affair in March 2017. And then those few months later in June is when she separated from Fotis, filed for divorce, and moved to New Canaan, Connecticut. Fotis had actually met Michelle in 2016 during a water skiing competition. Michelle was an avid water skier. She also had a passion for other sports like snow skiing and horseback riding. She was originally from Venezuela, so her native language is Spanish, which will come up later. They quickly began having an affair after they met. I would say in a much similar fashion to how it appears that Fotis's and Jennifer's relationship began because, you know, they hadn't seen each other for years. They met at the airport and then they began emailing while he was still married. So I think it's kind of a similar pattern. But once Jennifer had filed for divorce and moved herself and her five children, her and Fotis's five children out of their family home, Fotis moved Michelle in and pretty quickly it looks like. And she also had a young daughter, which also lived in Fotis's house, where he had previously had his entire family. He also, he also reportedly told Michelle that he and Jennifer were having an amicable divorce, which, I mean, <laughs> they weren't. We covered that a bit in the last one, but he told her that everything was fine and quote, there was no contention in it, which is arguably very false, but that's what he told her. So she thought, according to her and her lawyer, that Jennifer and Fotis's divorce was going smoothly. <laughs> Sorry, um, it's just, it, it wasn't. As I covered, they had a lot to say about one another. Jennifer in particular had a lot of things to say about Fotis, which I'm sure Fotis didn't like because, I mean, nothing I really saw seemed to cast him in a good light, but they also were arguing over custody. And Michelle is part of the reason that Fotis lost his portion of joint custody during the divorce proceedings. 
So, yeah. No, not amicable. <laughs> I would not call it amicable. I'm gonna, moving on from Michelle, that, Michelle does play a role in this and that's why I wanted to go ahead and cover her. Oh, actually, there is one other thing I wanted to cover and I mentioned a little bit, I mentioned just a smidge about Fotis's money troubles in the last part, which was that Fotis had gotten a loan from Jennifer's father when he was still alive for almost $2 million and he never repaid that back. I did see some reports that Hilliard, which was Jennifer's father, was very nice. And I think the fact that he was quite kind seemed to be something that Fotis took advantage of because Fotis never, as far as I am aware, Fotis never made repayments to Jennifer's father, which is why when her father died, her mother is the one that pressed for the suit filed against Fotis and ultimately won. But on top of the $2 million that he would owe Jennifer's family, it seems that Fotis had a lot of other money troubles. And let me see exactly, did I write down exactly how much it was? Yes, in total, Fotis was in debt up to $7 million, which is a lot of money. I think if I owed that much money, I would be having a panic attack. But he was making do in the meantime, seemingly by just moving funds around and doing some nice financial cartwheels in order to pay off other people, but he still owed the same amount of money. So he was moving things around to make do, but it, it obviously wasn't going to last forever. So there is a thought, and I just want to include this right here and now, there is a thought that would be presented later that Fotis believed that if Michelle were to disappear, not be in the picture, he would regain full custody of his children and in turn his children's trust funds because Jennifer's family had a lot of money and all five of her children from what I saw were set up with trust funds. I don't know how much those trust funds totaled, if they were $7 million worth, but with full custody, there is the idea that Fotis thought he would have access to the children's trust funds. So I just wanna put that out there. I'll come back to it later. I'm gonna jump back towards the investigation in the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos. So, during the investigation, it was uncovered two days prior to Jennifer's disappearance, which was May 24th. So on May 22nd, Fotis had his last supervised visit with his children. The original plan was for him to take the children to a park for a picnic nearby to Jennifer's New Canaan house. But Fotis's plan changed apparently after he found out that the park was closing early. So the plan switched to have Fotis visit with the children in Jennifer's new Canaan rental house's backyard. But Jennifer had, it seems she had reservations about this. She was probably pretty uncomfortable with it from my guess, given her and Fotis's relationship, but she did agree to let this supervised visit happen in her backyard, but she had the condition that Fotis was not allowed in the house, period, for any reason, and she locked the mudroom door, which is the back door of the house. So she had the door locked and he was already told that he could not come inside. So all well and good, visit goes fine, but two days later Jennifer disappears and there should be no reason for Fotis's DNA to be in her house. Because as I said, he wasn't allowed inside. But when police swabbed the interior knob of that mudroom back door, they found Fotis's DNA. That should not be there, but it is. So when police questioned Fotis for an alibi for May 24th, he had two people that represented to the police that Fotis had an alibi. And those people were Michelle Traconis, 
and Kent Mawini. Sorry. And Kent Mawini is a friend and his former attorney. So both of them established an alibi. And the alibi is as follows. Michelle said that her and Fotis got up, they showered, and had sex. And that was all before Michelle took her children to school. After, of course, after all of this happened in the morning, Michelle left, took her daughter to school, and was back bef around 8.15 in the morning. When she got back to the house, she said that she saw Fotis and Kent in Fotis's office of the house. It's like a whole area of the home that he had devoted to his workspace. So they were in his office and at 8.24 a.m. a friend of Fotis's called him from Greece. And here's the thing. Here's the thing with the whole thing. Here's the thing with his whole alibi is that the police would confirm later that for one thing, for the most important thing I would say, is that the friend of Fotis is that called him from Greece. Fotis had actually asked that friend to call him on May 24th at that exact time frame. So it, it was prearranged. It was a prearranged phone call. And I mean, that's kind of suspicious. Why would you have your friend call you at that exact time? But I'll get back to it. I'll get back to it in a minute. Just hold on for a second. Fotis's attorney in this case, in this investigation, was Norm Paytas, not Kent. Kent was his former attorney. His attorney in this case, Norm Paytas, would go on to make some arguably insane allegations uh, about Jennifer, including, but not limited to, that Jennifer had arranged her disappearance like something out of Gone Girl, and that Jennifer had struggled with a heroin addiction her whole life. It, you can imagine why the second one was definitely unfounded. But regardless of all of that, by August of 2019, Fotis's alibi would fall apart. And Michelle would admit in a follow-up interview with the police that she actually never saw Fotis the morning of the 24th. And on top of that, she had answered the phone when his friend had called from Greece at around 8.30. So it wasn't even Fotis that answered the phone. It was Michelle. And Michelle said that when the phone rang, Kent was at the house and gestured for Michelle to answer. Her attorney, to be fair, would go on to say that Michelle never lied to the police. And she had actually gotten confused because, as I said, her native language is Spanish and not English. Which I could get. I could get it, but why would your alibi that seems a bit prearranged also match up with the other person <laughs> that seems to be prearranging an alibi? But regardless. I can do whatever you want, but I didn't do it. You think you have information? I thought you had them, but I can want the whole world. The purpose is to show that she repeatedly, and I mean repeatedly, denied knowledge about the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos, denied having anything to do with it, and specifically saying that she had no, uh, nothing to hide and she was willing to help the police. Kent was allegedly also contradictory in his later interviews with the police, but admitted that he had also not seen photos the morning of the 24th. So what it looks like is that both of them lied and both of them were covering for photos. Introduced in court as well, notes commonly referred to by investigators as alibi scripts allegedly written by Michelle Traconis depicting a timeline of events the day Jennifer went missing. Bergen says it would be in police's favor to refer to the timeline as an alibi script, but it could also be seen as general notes written by Traconis. Did they know the reason they were covering for photos? I don't know, but... 
the alibi definitely seems fabricated. As I mentioned at the end of part one, Fotis gave his phone to investigators, and he did it willingly, but police were very careful to ensure that they preserved the data that was on the phone. And it was actually because of this, because they had taken the step to make sure to preserve the data, that investigators were able to track Fotis' movements from the 24th. And this would prove to be key evidence to the case they were making against him. Fotis and Michelle had apparently gone between the home that Fotis had lived in previously with Jennifer and the children, so their home now, they had gone between their home and another four group property throughout the afternoon of the 24th. And the two claimed that the reason they did this, the reason they went back and forth so many times, is because they have been cleaning the home. And cleaning the home required supplies like a vacuum, a Swiffer mop, Clorox spray, garbage bags, and paper towels. I'm gonna butcher his name again, but we're gonna try Powell Jumini. Jumini. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm just gonna call him PG for the rest of this. I'm sorry. I don't want to butcher his name so many times and he is very important. So I'm gonna call him PG. He would say that on May 29th, Fotis took his Toyota Tacoma to a car wash to have it cleaned and detailed. And Fotis also urged PG to replace the seats in the car. PG did do this, but being an intelligent person, he kept the original seats just in case police ever requested them, which praise, praise that he did because the police would go on to ask PG for the original seats in his Toyota Tacoma. And when they did, they uncovered a blood-like substance that contained Jennifer's DNA on the original seats for the car. One very interesting factor in this case is that police were careful to get all the security footage that they could, but the issue with this was that there didn't seem to be any evidence on the security footage, at least, of Fotis going to Jennifer's house on the 24th. But PG, lovely guy, had something to add. He had recently fixed Fotis's childhood bike and on surveillance cameras. And by the way, this bike was red. So on surveillance cameras, there is a person riding a red bicycle in the direction of Jennifer's rental home on the morning of May 24th. And the person was dressed in dark clothing with a hood pulled down over their face, which is a little suspicious. PG's Tacoma was shown on surveillance footage for the 24th, leaving Fotis' house at 5.35 a.m. and returning to his home at 12.30 p.m. So a little bit over a six-hour window where Fotis is essentially unaccounted for. This became the basis of the police's theory for the events of the 24th, and honestly, it's, it's a little crazy, but they aren't just pulling this out of thin air, it, it has backup. So let me tell you what it is. Police's theory was that Fotis drove the Toyota Tacoma from his house to Jennifer's new Canaan home, but he didn't go to her house. He parked his, the Toyota Tacoma in the park that I mentioned in the last video. And on footage from, I think it was a rust area, there is footage of the Toyota Tacoma with a, allegedly, a bicycle in the bed of the truck. So what the police's theory became was that he drove the Toyota Tacoma, parked it in the park, and he took out the bike from the bed of the car and bicycled three miles to Jennifer's new Canaan house where he would either lay in wait or surprise her when she got home from dropping off her children that morning. And she would have no idea the horror that would 
greet her when she got back to her house. But after the event at Jennifer's rental home in New Canaan, Fotis, in the police's theory, would put the bicycle in the back of her Chevrolet Suburban, because as I said, that Chevrolet Suburban was seen leaving her house around 10.30 a.m. on the 24th. And at that time, he would drive in the Chevrolet Suburban with the bicycle and Jennifer's body back to the park where he would dump her Suburban and put her body as well as the bike in the Toyota Tacoma and then drive back to Farmington, Connecticut, where he lived. And with all of this, it leaves him a plenty of time to get back to his house by 12.30 p.m. So that became the police's theory. When Jennifer's car was found, where someone had dumped it in the park, a search was launched for the park to try and find any indications of Jennifer Dulos. As the search of the park was going on, Fotis that same day invited Michelle to join him to go to a Starbucks in Hartford and they arrived there around 7 30 p.m. Police would use a search warrant to get the records for Fotis's phone to track his movements they had made that evening and they would go on to gather security footage. What they found by getting his movements and the security footage was Fotis dumping several garbage bags in various trash cans along the route that he took. Traconis was identified being in the car during this route when she actually leaned out of the passenger side to like touch something on the sidewalk or pick something up, but she said that she wasn't actually paying attention to what Fotis was doing uh, because she was on the phone during this time. Tonight, we're seeing that video for the first time. CBS 2's Tony Aiello has developments on what it shows and why it's being released. So the release of this video satisfies a powerful curiosity. Fotis Dulos in a black pickup. Perhaps unaware, he was on a Hartford street loaded with sophisticated surveillance cameras. It was the night of May 24th, 2019, just hours after Jennifer Dulos was reported missing. The video shows Fotis Dulos stopping to dump bags in the trash and also leaving what appears to be a car mat on the side of a deli. When cops traced his phone here and found this video, it was the first big break in the case. Girlfriend Michelle Traconis, who claims she was just along for the ride and not a knowing participant in disposing of evidence. Schoenhorn says the only clip with Traconis visible shows her wiping her hand on the ground but not helping Dulos dispose of evidence. Traconis told cops she did help Dulos clean a vehicle days after Michelle vanished, but thought any mess was spilled coffee. The defense released this clip to bolster that claim. Did you see spilled coffee? No, I didn't see that. Did you see a coffee cup? No, because I didn't look inside the car. When the police retrieved the trash bags, because of course they would, they found numerous items soaked in Jennifer Dulos's blood, including a Vineyard Vines shirt, a bra, some cleaning products like paper towels, sponges, a mop handle, gloves, a couple of rain ponchos, a towel, and four zip ties. Fotis's DNA would be identified on several items, but Michelle's DNA was also found on at least one of these garbage bags. It would take over six months, but by January 7th, 2020, Fotis Dulos would be charged with capital murder as well as murder and kidnapping. Michelle Traconis and Kent Mawini, Mawini? I don't know. Kent, his, his previous lawyer, would also be charged with conspiracy to commit murder. And I think that's more or less due to that they f helped him fabricate an alibi. I don't know, specifically for Michelle, if that included the DNA that was found for her on one of the trash bags. I th think, don't quote me, don't yell at me please, but I, I think it's mainly to do with the alibi 
lies that they were coming up with. Fotis Dulos would be released on house arrest after posting six million dollar bond but would have an emergency hearing scheduled for January 28th because he had revoked terms of his bond and would likely, probably definitely, have to return to jail. And I do want to note back a little to what I mentioned at the beginning of this video, which is that Fotis was in debt up to his eyes. Like, I don't even know if he could see past the $7 million of debt that he had and the trust fund factor with his children and the idea that if he regained full custody, he would have access to those trust funds. That became a huge motive for the alleged murder in this case. So I do want to note that again before I tell you this next part. And I do want to just say that I will be discussing some factors of suicide here. So if that triggers you, I'll, I'll put a timestamp up. If you don't want to hear it, no pressure, but I'll put a timestamp up just so you can see where to skip to if you don't want to hear about it. It's only going to be a few seconds. But on January 28th, which was the day that his emergency hearing was scheduled for, Fotis never showed up. When he was checked on at his home, it was discovered that Fotis had attempted suicide via carbon monoxide poisoning. He had actually hooked up a vacuum hose to his car, closed his garage and sealed it, and turned on his car to attempt to commit suicide. He had written a, a long note for his proclaiming Michelle Draconis's and Kent's innocence, which I do want to read right now. So let me pull that up. Okay, so the note reads, and it is dated January 28th, 2020. It says, all, if you are reading this, I am no more. I refuse to spend even an hour more in jail for something I had nothing to do with. Enough is enough. If it takes my head to end this, so be it. I want it to be known that Michelle Traconis had nothing to do with Jennifer's disappearance. And neither did Kent Mawini. Sorry. I asked the state to let them free of any such accusations. I also asked the state to stop harassing my friends. They are honorable people. Please let my children know that I love them. I would do anything to be with them. But unfortunately, we all have our limits. The state will not rest until I rot in jail. My attorney can explain what happened with the bags on Albany Avenue. Everything else is a story fabricated by the law enforcement. I want to thank all my family and friends that stood by me this difficult time. I am sorry for letting you down and not continuing to fight. Fotis. Fotis would be alive when people had initially arrived to check on him, but he would die two days later from his injuries. So that concludes this case. I have a couple things I want to say that I didn't include, but there is... Jennifer Dulos's body has never been found. And there are some people out there that say it will never be found. There, I remember reading when I first heard about this case that there was some theories that Fotis had actually destroyed Jennifer's body via, like, I actually don't know how you do it, which is probably a good thing, but using, like, acid or something to completely destroy her body. I mean, you also have a factor to consider in that Fotis Dulos owned a luxury real estate development company. So his access to properties could influence the fact that Jennifer's body has never been found. There's, there's really endless possibilities if you think about it. I mean, depending on what portfolio he had where he could have put it, where he could have put her. So, which is just, it's very, 
heartbreaking to hear that because there are five children now that are orphans likely due to their own father and their father who may have committed this crime will never have to answer for it and he will never be able to offer them reasons why he did it or offer them any closure which is so so sad five children are orphaned and they'll never know what happened Jennifer and Fotis's children do live with, I believe, Jennifer's mother in Manhattan. So, I mean, at least they have family to support them, which is, I mean, all you could hope for in this case. But it is still very sad. And answers are going to be really hard to find because someone who should have been able to offer them is no longer here. Michelle and Kent are in ongoing, are having ongoing legal problems with this. I believe their conspiracy to commit murder is still on the table and they are still to be prosecuted for it. I think I saw that Kent Mawini was on house arrest for a long time and I think he just got off of house arrest. Oh yeah, okay. So, Michelle Traconis is having a jury trial. And it looks like as recently as last month, October 11th, they were in jury selection. The trial from Michelle Traconis is expected to, is scheduled at least, to begin January 8th of 2024 and could last all the way until March 1st. Ah, yes, okay, that is correct. In May of this year, Kent Mawinney was released from house arrest. No trial date, from what I'm reading, has been set for Kent Mawinney. Ah, he was, he was granted conditional release from house arrest, allowing him to visit his ailing father. That's fine. Um, but yeah, so there's ongoing issues just because... One person is gone and wrote a suicide note proclaiming two other people's innocence does not make it so. And Kent and Michelle are seeing this firsthand. So I, I am hopeful that maybe one of them can offer some answers. But as far as I can see, five children are left with basically the only confirmation being that their mother and father are both gone. So that concludes that case. Yeah. So if you tend to watch this kind of content, if you've watched all the way to the end of this video, I would appreciate it if you would like and or subscribe. I will be back next week with another case. I think, I think the next case I'm going to cover is going to be split up into parts too, but we shall see. So, I hope you have a good day, and I hope to see you next time.